I'll start by saying I had a dream. I don't know. I, I don't dream very often. My daughter is obsessed with dreams. Every single morning she wakes up and is like, can I tell you about the dream that I had? Or she actually, she started to fall asleep <laughs> the other night. And she goes, as she's fading off, she goes, oh, good night, dad. I hope I have some sick dreams. <laughs> so I just waited there for her to come back. Then a dragon appeared and tried to eat me. But I had one and it was, you know, the, you know, the age old dream of like, uh, it's mid semester. Oh yeah. Right. And I haven't been take like I, I enrolled in the class, but I haven't been going to the class. Yeah. I, I used to be in theater. So I did a lot of theater and I was mm. acting and I had big parts, lots of, lots of lines. And yeah, that's the same dream I have. It's like, Oh, you're in this play tomorrow. And um, I'm like, oh, I, do, I didn't remem memorize any of the lines uh, and yeah. I've got to do this play. What do I do? The other one <laughs> that I think everybody can relate to every the, 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 the famous <laughs> dream is that you're naked, right? right that's right, not right. my that's not exactly my dream. <laughs> my dream <laughs> is that I decided to go out. Basically, Ooh. <laughs> I, I was like, it's fine. I'll just wear underwear and go and go to work or whatever. And, you know, it's like one o'clock p.m. And I'm like. I've been walking around in underwear in front of everybody all fucking day. And I'm like regretting it terribly. Like, <laughs> why did I do this? It doesn't, this doesn't work in the office. <laughs> it seemed like such a good idea. You know, go, you're cooler, get like, more ventilation. Like, like, like one testicle has been popping out all day. And I, <laughs> you start to like, you, you, like as the dream becomes more lucid, you're like, could I be in legal trouble? You know, like the, the practicality of, of it starts to set in. Your behavior was unprofessional and uncalled for. But when it's done with this kind of wit and style, it's all in good fun. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you should lighten up, toots. Yeah, like Case dismissed. So wait, do you have do you have actually boxers on or do you have like comical tidy whities No, I, I, I would have boxers, I think, in the in this situation or, or I might be fully nude. Maybe like, you know, like Winnie the Pooh style or like short, like a small red shirt and no pants. <laughs> just walking around free balling. Oh, bother. <laughs> oh, bother. I should probably go home and put some rumblies on my tumblies. <laughs> you mean put on pants? <laughs> <laughs> on your junk? I need to pull you into my office and have a, a very difficult <laughs> conversation, Pooh. Pooh, you're making the workplace very uncomfortable. <laughs> well, if it's going to be free balling. <laughs> so piglet, pull down my drawers. <laughs> well, I don't know if I should do that. Unpin my tail. <laughs> it's not a very good tail, but I'm kind of attached to it. Thanks. It's not much of a tail. But I'm sort of attached to it. Speaking of sick dreams, we got a really weird um, comment from somebody, somebody named Lisa Markinko. This was on the Why Mate Quit video. Does anyone on here have reoccurring nightmares or scream and cry in their sleep, but enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> Did we talk about that in that video at all? <laughs> is this Not just a the... thing. There's no dream talk. <laughs> she just was like, hey, while well, everybody's here, um, <laughs> run something by it. <laughs> you know that's what happens you you put something out on the internet and people are gonna <laughs> they're gonna respond back so i did have a dream anyway and the dream was that i wasn't done making my first movie <laughs> wow it was, a, it was a terrible feeling i was like oh shit like i've been working on this for a long time i was like i gotta so, and I think what, like the, the, the way it was playing on my, my anxieties in the dream was my first movie, it was called, I need to lose 10 pounds. It was a comedy. It was a musical. It was, you know, like way too much, way too big of an idea, way too many locations, way too much everything for, you know, what I was 16 and I finished it when I was 20. It was challenging for all kinds of reasons. Like for instance, I wrote it really young. I was finishing it really old, you know, like in college, you know, it, it, it did well at trauma dance at one trauma dance and you know, it got, it got distributed by them and um, it was fun. Like, so, you know, some people really liked it. We it certainly cut our teeth in filmmaking and um, shot for like four years, but one of the biggest challenges of it, and I don't like to talk about it like too in detail because like there's, you know, people involved and stuff, but basically the, the main actor was somebody who committed to the movie like at a really young age, just like I was committing to making a movie at a really young age. And as it went on, like for years, like into the first year, second year, 
he was like, he didn't want to be part of it anymore. He was, uh, it was making him wake up early on a lot of weekends and the content was exploitative in some ways, you know, it was like over the top comedy and Mm -hmm. a lot of like self-deprecating stuff. And, um, I think, you know, I, I think he just like, didn't want to be an actor. He was just, wasn't having fun with it. And, and it was disastrous because we were like a year or two in and he was like being kind of serious about quitting. Mm. Like at one point he did quit. It was like, we, we, we shot like an action sequence where he got like nicked in the chin and he, uh, he was like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to quit. You, you do it. You be the, the main actor. And we had to like seriously consider like recasting mid movie, making a joke about it, but you can't even do it mid movie because we shot completely out of order. So it, it would have mm. been like two years of footage down the drain and, at that age, all I cared about was making this movie or it, all I cared about was finishing it, making progress on it. I remember like as high school graduation was approaching, feeling like a sense of dread because I was like, oh, I should be much closer to finishing the movie. It got to be a point where people only knew me as like, oh, that's the guy who's trying to finish that movie. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was like, you know, and my advice to anybody who wants to do a big project is like, you got to finish it. You got to finish it. Um, because it's, that's like the confidence you're going to carry to the next project. And if there's a finished project and it's halfway decent, that's the thing you'll be able to show people. That's the thing that you'll be able to use to excite people to the, to the next one. Cause on the first one, you got no credibility. You're just somebody who wants to do something. You've ne- you're not somebody who's ever done anything before. And so like you have to grind. And I, I remember thinking like, Oh, should we just cut these scenes? Should we just, um, cut some corners should we like how do you i remember my dad too because he was watching his son like kind of spiral hopelessly (laughs) he was was like what do you have to do to get this finished you know Mm. and i I remember i had um i had like home depot lights in my trunk for like years like those yellow Uh like headlamp ones that were totally inappropriate for for um filming they weren't soft in any way they were just big (laughs) lights yep um and I had like, I had a bag, like a Spencer's gifts, plastic bag full of, um, plastic limbs. Cause often like th- there were joke gags in the movie where somebody would lose a limb or something. There's always limbs everywhere. Like a, a foot, a bludgeoned foot, a bludgeoned hand. <laughs> now I lived for a while. Matt so, from Mock Mac was in it. So in your dream, those were still in your trunk. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait, what do I still have to do to, to call it finished, to finish the movie? I was like, I, uh, oh well, I have most of the scenes, but I don't have the main actor's angles on them. So maybe if I can just convince him to like spend like one more day, we can get the angles. If we hit, you know, that, that's where I was like problem solving that. And I, and, <laughs> and in the dream, I was like, well, really probably the movie's done. Right. Like, I don't think you need those angles. Like the audience will get it. And I was like, no, 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 no. We've come this far. Let's get every angle we wanted to get. That's where I, it was so weird. And I woke up, but like, this went on for like two hours and it, 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 I, from like 4am to 6am. I was like trying to finish my first movie. And I, and there were times during the dream where I was like, <laughs> I'm 38. This is the movie I finished when I was 20. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm 38 and I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I told Nina about it later. Nina, who, you know, was there for the whole thing originally. And she was like, yeah, I probably wouldn't support still working on the movie here at age 28. <laughs> age 38. So anyway, that got me to thinking, when does a project get too complicated where like you've got to kind of go back to the drawing board or you've got to reel it in a bit? You know, often like you'll receive a piece of feedback or criticism about, you know, some creative work that you did. And, you know, a lot of times it's very valid or, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll see something in the movie. They're like, oh, uh, this is a little off center. This is a little weird. I didn't quite understand this or. I don't buy into the fiction because the location is strange or whatever. And I remember it, especially when I was younger, just thinking like, yeah, you're right. But it's kind of the difference between the movie existing and not existing. (laughs) I I learned to not be a perfectionist pretty fast. You feel better about yourself as soon as you get more and more projects under your belt and you have, you just have to finish them. Yeah. Even if they're like imperfect, even if, you know, you just got to, you got to mark them done, <laughs> you yep. gotta put them it's out true. to the world and learn, get your lessons. And then you can start the next one. It's, it's funny. Cause I was just at this, like uh, a, another like leadership thing. And they did this. I'm sure a lot of people out there, they did it in our, in our scouts group too, Gloria's scouts group. It's like almost oh. the same, almost the same exact uh, exercise. It's that corny thing where like they break you up into groups. They give you 18 minutes and they give you raw spaghetti a full one full size marshmallow, a little bit of rope and a little bit of masking tape. And they go, uh, uh, whoever builds the tallest structure in the amount of time, you know, in the, a lot of time 
And it also, by the way, it, it has to be freestanding. Um, so you can't hold it up, prop it up with your own hands. Um, tallest structure that has the marshmallow at the top wins. What you find is groups that over planned and found themselves putting the marshmallow only at in the last minute or two minutes, their, their, their structures almost always collapse. They almost always lose and they can, you know, mm. they don't end up not participating because they spent the first five to 10 minutes planning their structure and then they can't put anything at the top. Whereas, and apparently like kindergartners were a group that does really well at this exercise. <laughs> the, pe the people who don't plan, the people who just dive for spaghetti and just start trying to crap something together, um, they always win <laughs> or they have a much higher likelihood of winning. And the reason is this, nobody, statistically speaking, really understands how heavy the, the marshmallow is. Yeah. Um, you don't know it until the end when you go, oh, mm. shit. Like I built this beautiful thing and the marshmallow doesn't, doesn't hold up. And the people who dive in quickly, they learn that the marshmallow is heavy much earlier in the process. And then they're able to kind of like scrap it and reiterate, try again, iterate again. Right. And maybe they don't get that tall, but they get the marshmallow at the top. They finish it. They cross the right. finish line. Mm -hmm. And that got me thinking about like stories and story structure. Like I think during the Barbie talk, we, we said like, what are the three essential components of a screenplay? There's the, the story. That is to say, what's it about, right? What's the, um, not what, not sp specifically the plot, like not, Hey, we're looking for infinity stones, but what is, what's, what's this thing about? Why does this thing exist? What's it teaching us about ourselves and about the world? You know, you know, Rocky's not about boxing, for example. And then there's story structure. So structure I think is about like pacing and rhythm. So that's like, you know, if it's an hour and 40 minute movie, probably by mi minute 20, we should have the inciting incident. We should be, you know, the status quo should be broken. We should, we should be into our story. I can probably think of movies where like the story was really strong. There was a really good reason to tell that story. I think of the prequels, honestly, mm. where like, it, it, like telling the story of Darth Vader's fall is a good story. It's a worthy thing to tell a story about. But I, I think the structure pacing order chronology is kind of flawed, like quite flawed. Be with me. Be with me. These are your final steps, Ray. Rise and take them. I don't like sand. And then the, the third would be your character and dialogue work, learning who the characters are and, and relating to them. And I think like it's so, so, so common that you'll start writing. Like you have to just start building the fucking spaghetti. <laughs> you yeah. have to just start writing and like you'll figure out like what is it I'm trying to support with what I'm writing. Because you, you probably go in not knowing uh, or you think, you know, and you realize like, and the, the, the thing that has happened to me every time I've written a story or whenever I've collaborated with people, like I see other people do it. I see smart people do it. It's like a natural law or something. Like, I don't know. I don't even know how you would avoid this. You always get bogged down by irrelevant, erroneous, strange plot details that you made up and you imposed on your own story accidentally. <laughs> like I remember we were writing, having fun up there together. We had post-it notes and we were doing that whole thing. And we had this like conception of Mark, the main character, has like a roommate and the roommate's going to move out and the roommate's got a girlfriend and like it's going to like it, it, uh, implicate his rent situation and maybe he's going to have to like live on a couch. Like we had this whole thing. And after, a, like, you know, after you dig in deep enough, you go past that and you kind of get to the end, you go back to the middle and you realize you're like, why is all this roommate shit in this movie? <laughs> 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 you're like this has nothing to do with the story we're telling at all. But we probably didn't know what story we were telling when we were mm. dreaming up all this shit. You might think like that's what a, a, an amateur writer might do, but a more experienced seasoned writer might not box themselves into that corner. I think that's probably not true. I think that seasoned writers box themselves into weird corners all the time and have to kind of like go back to the top or, or they're, they're, I think there's almost like most writers have some moment where they go, Oh, what is all this shit? T tear this down. Simplify this, simplify, 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 because now I actually know where I'm going. Now I actually know, you know, I, I get just to use the stupid spaghetti analogy. It's like, maybe you build some ridiculous, like inverted pyramid thing, but you're like, this doesn't help me support the marshmallow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was, I, I was watching a uh, yester worlds, right? YouTube channel that does stuff about behind the scenes of amusement parks, movies, TV shows, old studios, that kind of thing. It's a good, good, very good YouTube channel. Ones that were shelved and never saw the light of day, such as those we've explored in previous episodes. And I was watching one about original versions of Disney classics. So he covered Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Frozen. Beauty and the Beast was 
a movie that was in production f- or it was in development for like like three or four years before they finally did anything with it. If you look at the, they, in fact, they did a whole animatic of like the first act to present to the studio. And the studio said like, you, this ain't it. Like tear it apart. Hmm. It was like, okay, Belle is the daughter of a merchant named Maurice and they live in a mansion because he does very well. And she's got a sister and the mom dies and that uh, uh, it, it, somehow they're ruined and they have to move out of the mansion and then they move in with like the evil aunt <laughs> and then the aunt wants Gaston to marry Belle. And it was just like all this shoe leather that, re- you know, just didn't get you cl- mm. any, cl- any closer to the beast and Belle. Right. Which is like the heart of the thing. Um, like what the hell is all this shit? And it's, it, you can tell what happened. They were like, no, how about she's just a weird girl in her town. She doesn't fit in. And her dad goes to the castle and like, we get yeah. the, you know, like just t- strip it down. Well, I, I, I feel like the problem with like Disney plus shows is that they're just all shoe leather and <laughs> they yeah. never get, they yeah. never get to the essential story. That's, uh, that's to- so spot on. Cause I was thinking that too. I, I was like, you know, and do you know, I think I know the reason why that is. It's because they rush everything into production. They green light everything quickly. And if if you don't sit with your story, you will not discover how <laughs> fucked up and shoe leathery it is. You yeah. have to like stick. You have to stay with it for a while. Too late. You'll find out the marshmallow's too heavy. <laughs> yeah. You have to sleep on it. You got to play with it more. You got to have more people read it. You've got to break it. You've got to be like, oh, this thing I was attached to that I thought was integral to the story. It's not integral at all. You have to like meditate on it for, for like, I think a while, you know, you have to really like be like sit there with the, with the content. And so if you're like rushing it into production, cause they want to put, they want to get on that volume and start shooting. Not only that, but you have to write like multiple like episodes of this thing. That's how, that's how, um, secret invasion happens, you know? Yeah. Well, that was, it was funny. The, the tweet I showed you where somebody was like, Oh, don't worry. The acolyte isn't using the volume at all. And it's like, it's amazing how we've gone from like four years. We've gone to like this amazing new technology. The volume is going to change everything. And mm-hmm. now they're just like embarrassed. It's like, we're not using that shit no more. Uh, I mean, they were trying to make the snow queen at Disney for 50 years or something. Like Walt was trying to make it happen. And they kept not being able to figure it out. I think they were unable to figure out, like, is she a villain or not? And Hmm. it wasn't until somebody was like, maybe they're sisters. And it was like, oh, we're telling a story about sisters. Aladdin, it was similar where they actually start with, you know, like like any good musical, they start with the music. So Alan Menken and Howard, whatever his name is, they like kind of like put together the, the, you know, all the musical numbers. And then they design the story kind of around that. Howard said, if you can take a song and you can remove it from the script, and the script still makes sense. You you haven't done your job. So like in the case of Frozen, for instance, like Bobby Lopez and Kristen Lopez are kind of like co-writers with the screenwriters, mm. you know, the, the, like a Broadway musical might be. Because then the songs are your major story beats. The other one that I was thinking of was, uh, you know, they give you on Lord of the Rings, they gave so much insight about the process. And the, the one that you, like you almost can't believe it. It's so it seems so stupid when Frodo is drawing closer to throwing the ring into the fire and Aragorn leads an army to march on Mordor you know, to kind of distract Mordor while to give Frodo a chance. Um, they, sh- not only did they write, but they shot Sauron coming out and fighting Aragorn with a fucking sword. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when he was this kind of more ethereal threat, when in, mm. in effect, he was the ring. They mm-hmm. ruined that by being like, how about they get in a fist fight? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. How about they go, they get scrappy with each other and yeah, they shot it, man. And they had to, re- <laughs> they're like, what do we do with all this footage? And they replaced it with, um, a, tr- a troll, a CG troll. And so he's sword fighting a CG troll in the final movie. And, you know, they, <laughs> through the power of video editing and so, you know, they, they've made it all kind of work, but, um, but you think like, uh, if, it, you know, if I did a, if I wrote a screenplay and it's convoluted and doesn't get to the point and doesn't, it, it doesn't find its own story or whatever, like, I must be an idiot. I must be a bad screenwriter. It's like, you are not an idiot. Like everybody, you know, mm. the best filmmakers of all time, the people who won the most Oscars, you know, of anybody, um, they, they sometimes have Aragorn fighting with Sauron with a sword. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Cry. Cry like Sauron when he lost his contact lens. Nobody move. Nobody move. Does, does, does anybody see it? It might be stuck to a tree or a rock. Anyone? Oh, I am so grounded. Subscribe to Red Cow Entertainment on Patreon for full episodes every other week.